Welcome to the webinar, everyone. This is the open house for the Yale Global Executive Leadership Program. My name is Kristen Sorg West, and I'm the Director of Marketing for Executive Education here at the Yale School of Management. On the call with me today is Joanne Legler. Joanne, uh, give us a little wave. There she is. She is our Senior Director of Learning Partnerships. Joanne is a wonderful advisor, I gotta tell you. Often she's the first person prospective participants speak with to learn more about our programs and understand if they're a good fit. So I'll be moderating the chat and the Q&A and fielding incoming questions. And Joanne will sometimes pop in also to answer questions in the chat and live as well. So as we kick things off, just a few housekeeping items. As I mentioned, we encourage you to both use the chat and the Q&A throughout the webinar. This time together, this is a discussion. So we're going to answer your questions along the way. Please submit them as they come up. Finally, we are recording this webinar and the recording will be distributed afterwards to all registrants. So we're here today to talk about the Yale Global Executive Leadership Program and what you can expect to take away from the program should you attend. The Yale Global Executive Leadership Program, or YGELT as we call it for short, is an on-campus, in-person executive program hosted at the School of Management. It exists to expand and improve the impact of leaders like you. The program is held over 10 months, with participants coming to campus three times a year for one week or two week long modules. And during their time on campus, participants learn from renowned scholars and industry leaders. They gain global perspectives, they build their executive leadership skill set, and they elevate their capacity to drive organizational, organizational success while weighing the interests of all stakeholders. Between modules, participants reconnect in monthly virtual meetings to catch up and continue the discussions started in the classroom. So we have a fantastic panel for you today. Three past participants are here with us. We have Marcelo, Bar sorry, Marcelo Barroso, Madhu Muju, and Kino Sadler. Leading our conversation is the YGELP Faculty Director and Senior Associate Dean for Leadership Studies and Lester Crown Professor in the Practice of Management, Jeffrey Sonnenfeld. Professor Sonnenfeld is also the founder and president of the Chief Executive Leadership Institute, a nonprofit educational and research institute focused on CEO leadership and corporate governance. Previously, he served as a full tenured professor at Emory's Goizeta Business School for a decade and a professor at the Harvard Business School for a decade. Professor Sonnenfeld's research has been published in 100 scholarly articles, which appeared in the leading academic journals in management, such as Administ Administrative Sciences Quarterly, the Academy of Management Journal, the Academy of Management Review, the Journal of Organizational Behavior, Social Forces, Human Resources, or Human Relations, and Human Resource Management. He has also authored eight books, including The Hero's Farewell, an award-winning study of CEO succession, and another bestseller, Firing Back, a study on leadership resilience in the face of adversity. Without further ado, please welcome Professor Sonnenfeld. Uh, thank you uh, so much. I, I, I appreciate that, that, kind, uh, that kind introduction. I uh, hope you can all hear me okay. Uh, but I, I should have uh, said, oh, uh, uh, please, more ado. I was enjoying hearing that, even though probably a third of the people hate me already. That was such a generous introduction. Uh, but thanks for going through it. And we have, uh, the truth is, we have a galaxy of stars with us on this panel, who are the ones that you have kindly let me uh, introduce next in line. But I just do want to say that speaking of galaxy of stars, I am so happy that you asked uh, for who's called in from where is uh, while we, uh, you know, take a look at this list and take a look at, at some of the folks on with us, it's it's extraordinary that we've got, got Tracy from Vancouver, uh, we have C from uh, Toronto, we have Jessica, I'm just uh, Mariana from La, La Paz, Bolivia, and Josefina from uh, from Chile, uh, and uh, uh, oh, uh, Lithuania, Lemma, that's fantastic, Singapore, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's just you know, a page down here, uh, New Zealand, Christian. I wonder actually who would get the uh, distance award if we were all in person. Uh, uh, South South Africa, Katunda, Katunda. We we uh, 
we really have a, a, a great reach here uh, uh, geographically, but I'm sure also in terms of industry and in, in terms of all kinds of demographic, ethnic, cultural uh, uh, mixes, uh, I bet we've got it already just on this call today. And that's, we have been so proud of in the programs here is that we learn so much from each other's backgrounds and the richness of people's interests and life experience. And that's what you're gonna see in today's panel uh, that we're so lucky. I will read you some of the uh, uh, highlights of some of our panelists joining us today. Madhu, Madhu Mojo, who, ju who just so kindly said that she uh, called in somehow on my line for this call. And she said, we could have switched identities. I feel just the opposite is uh, she's a senior executive with more than 24 years of experience, but I don't believe that for a second. Uh, obviously it's way too youthful, and, but all in information technology advisory business. She started when she was three years old and, uh, and, and uh, also business consulting and management. She's assisted fortune 1000 companies in building and transforming their business operations. During the course of her career, Medu led uh, several large-scale business transformations, uh, 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 M&A uh, integration, enterprise-wide technology initiatives, and she's known for her ability to synthesize business strategy to identify drivers and opportunities. Uh, some of her strengths are included as a change agent. She's really a convin convincing, uh, passionate leader. She really inspires, motivates teams well, and has done this with her classmates, that somehow she could be uh, an extremely prepared, well-organized, brilliant student, and nobody hates her. They all loved her in classes, and you can see that's in, on the job, too, in building teams and consensus. Uh, she has a great deal of experience in high-performing teams across industries, high-tech manufacturing, communications, and healthcare, and a deep experience, we're happy to tell you, in AI, RPA, systems integration, managed services, and driving transformation at the uh, at the enterprise level. She's presently a senior principal in advisory services at, at KPMG. Uh, Kino Sadler is a partner at managing director at, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, CXO at Purpose. Uh, Kino brings over also a quarter of a century, I don't believe that for a sec, but it too started at three years old, of experience as a social entrepreneur, creating and implementing innovative programs in education, leadership development, and social justice with a background that, and by the way, I believed you sat pretty much towards the back row center, didn't you? If, if not, don't correct me, but I, you, say, you try to have an image as who sat where in the room, but uh, that he did not, yes, so uh, we'll have to click off his mic. With a, a background that blends military service, classroom teaching, and organizational development rooted in diversity, equity, and inclusion. He delivers C-suite level leadership and guidance to multidisciplinary teams, delivering social impact globally, while also leading multiple global teams responsible for developing focused and supported purpose workforce. Before purpose, Kino served as vice president of programs at Echoing Green Foundation, where he provided strategic leadership to Echoing Green's flagship fellowship programs designed to identify, develop, and support early stage social justice and climate change leaders. In 1995, 1997, Echo Green Fellow himself, Kino created the Breakthrough Atlanta program, an empowering educational experience that has resulted in equitable access to higher education for over 2,000 Atlanta middle school students and prepared over 400 college-age teaching fellows for educational sector roles. As an educator at heart with a passion for leadership development, Kino also co-created and taught the Resilient Leadership course at Yale and has served as an executive coach to a wide range of impact leaders around the world. After hours, uh, you, you could, he certainly knows his way around the New York restaurant scene. He's a good guy to know. Uh, and after you do that and you feel so guilty, you have to work off all the uh, fantastic uh, gourmet dining. He then take you on bike trails to explore working towards his next belt in karate or jujitsu. So you don't want to argue with this guy unless you're really prepared. Uh, he knows how to defend himself entirely too well. Uh, Marcelo, Marcelo Barroso is a vice president of supply chain services for Teneras, the leading supplier of tubular and related services for the world's energy industry and other industrial applications. In his present role, he's responsible for Teneras supply chain services, which consists of defining and driving the strategic agenda for the RIG Direct program. Besides uh, Marcelo's res responsibilities include the technical expertise of a global network of 250 field service specialist deployed in 50 locations worldwide. Marcel started his career in Tenaris 25 years ago. He served a variety of positions in supply chain operations uh, in Romania and Brazil, 
uh, Asia Pacific, and before his current role, responsible for all supply chain activities in the Eastern Hemisphere. He has a background, a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering uh, uh, from Buenos Aires in Argentina, a master's degree from Stanford, but still a nice guy, uh, and uh, the global executive program, of course, here at Yale, which we're delighted to talk about today. But I'm I'm so glad uh, that we have uh, these. 66 fabulous participants with us, but thrilled to death that Kino, Marcello, and Madhu, that you have somehow created time in your busy schedules to join us today to relive those golden days of yesteryear and talk about, um, as we miss you, we miss you guys dearly on campus. But um, uh, as, as you know, uh, we had uh, talked a little bit in advance about what might be some fun questions to ask you. Uh, so I thought, why follow that script? Why not just ambush you cold? And there you were with all uh, decades of experience behind you. Uh, why in the world did you decide to disrupt your, your your soaring careers and take this departure to come off to campus? What was it that made you think that this was the time to do it? And of course, the follow up question that this was the place to do it. But how did you decide to, to, to make that move, Madhu? That's a brilliant question, and I didn't expect anything less, a professor, so was <laughs> waiting for that ambush. Uh, but what a brilliant question. Um, one thing that I was very clear was, um, I mean, if I had to do it, I would do it at Yale. Stanford is a neighboring uh, university, and my uh, my daughter, who just turned 18, is going to Stanford. Yet Congrat I didn't choose Congratulations. <laughs> uh, we're sorry Thank we you. lost a good customer, but congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I didn't choose to go to Stanford. I decided to uh, come to Yale. And again, the diversity that Yale brings is very rare. And that was that was absolutely an attraction for me. I've spent uh, most of my life serving tech industry as a consultant. And I really wanted to have a different flavor uh, to, my, uh, to my career and to the intellectual build an intellectual muscle that's uh, that's outside uh, technology uh, world. And that's when uh, Yale really stood up. Indra Nui was another reason why I, uh, I decided to join Yale. She has been, she's been someone that, that's been a hero. And uh, she is from Yale and that was, she was, a, she was the magnet that really pulled me to Yale. Those were really the two, I would say, reasons I decided to, to take the commute that I did. Well, th those are a couple of great reasons. Uh, we And uh, uh, we're especially proud of Indra, of course, as not only has been a trustee here at Yale, but of course, as a proud graduate of the Yale School of Management, been very loyal to us. And uh, she's uh, actually been quite active with our Chief Executive Leadership Institute and a, a generous donor to that too. But we we love to, for her to bob and weave into the programs. And this uh, the Yale Global Executive Leadership Program happens to be one in particular that she loves to come through and meet people. So I'm, I'm glad that you, you, men you mentioned her there are, are now uh, 40 South Asians and top leadership roles, CEO roles of Fortune uh, major, major firms. Uh, but she was a real pioneer, and she, uh, like everybody on this call, has a lot of experience, but is still quite young, and a lot of more mileage uh, yet for her to come. But I'm glad that Yale was uh, such a strong magnet for you, and we got you here despite that evil Stanford. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm, well, I'm going to come back to you in a few minutes. The, the hardball follow-up question is going to be, well, did you make the right choice? Did we did we measure up to this? Kino, how about you, now that you got the chance for the sneak preview on that hardball question? Yeah, the disruption that you talked about, I was also at the same time just going through a disruption myself. So I was transitioning, you know, as you said in my bio, from Echoing Green to the uh, Purpose, which is a for-profit organization. It's the first time I'd ever worked in a for-profit, first time I ever worked in a global. So I was just like transitioning to a new role in a new organization and wanted to pause and have access to a curriculum that would help prepare me for that. I was also going to an organization that was in its own inflection point. So it was still founder led. It was still a relatively young organization, but scaled in pretty fast. And I thought that not only my own growth, but the access to the resources and the curriculum that Yale would provide would help me and my role help the organization grow as well. Um, I was also looking to just join or you know extend my network. I mean, we're talking about Yale, you know, and its global reach, not only the cohort that I'll be connected to, but also the broader alumni network. Uh, but specifically within the 
cohort, just having a chance to interact with people who are from the communities and from the regions and in the in the areas that I would be working in. So just having a chance to just to grow my network in that space. Um, the follow-up question, um, was it the right, like why did I decide why Yelp? Um, it checked all those boxes, uh, but I was also looking for an experience. Um, I looked at some organ some of the programs and they don't, they might be purely virtual. I looked at some organization, um, some programs and it might have just been uh, like a year or something, but like on campus. And I was looking for a blend of an on campus experience that was substantive, but also the virtual experience because I wanted to you know continue doing my role. And Yale, Yale met that. And I guess the last one is I had a familiarity with Yale uh, from an outside. Uh, I, as you said earlier, I was a uh, lecturer and I've just done some things on campus. So I just had a chance to interact with the community, but as an outsider and having a chance to really become part of the community, be you know, in, immersed in the culture of Yale, at least through the YGEL program perspective was just uh, an added value and it proved to be true. I, I'm really glad to hear that too. And I'm glad that so far two out of three I uh, didn't mind this ambush question because Kristen looked at me like, hey, Jeff, how dare you depart from what we just talked about? But I thought this would be more fun to catch you off guard. And so far, you guys haven't complained. And Marcella, we'll see if you pick up the ball on this as well. Now that you've had much more time than Madhu had to prepare for her excellent opening. But I also want to mention, and Marcella, you don't have to feel you have to pick up the ball on this part. Both of them mentioned uh, by surprise, uh, extemporaneously, the... Uh, the Yale legacy of, 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 of alums. We want to mention that this program, while it's a young program, has developed, as the three of you represent, an incredibly intense, loyal network. Some of these groups uh, either meet on weekends, on calls, on, on updates, and we, you know, we do these uh, we, periodic monthly updates where we extend uh, people from the past if they'd want to parachute in and on occasion for some of these calls if it's something of relevance. But also people have nothing to do with this program that are part of Yale's executive education in general or Yale School of Management in general or a 322 university year old university that actually has um, a lot of great alums uh, that are available and interested to talk to people because you are considered part of the Yale community while in the program. But I don't mean to ad lib and go off on your great responses and raise the bar for Marcelo to match that. But Marcelo, try to match that. Well, the, the fact that the I decided uh, Yale, if you want, we start by saying at the end of the day, we want to be part of an elite school. And that uh, elite school at the end of the day is matched by the professors, the lectures that we have that have deep uh, subject matter of knowledge and what we have. And remember that some of the professors that we had at the time were also professors that were giving their classes for the MBA student. The fact is that when they come to give those classes to us, they see different managers, some people that are top on their own executive career. So the interaction is quite valuable and they check with us in a, in a totally different way. Um, on top of that is the access to the industry leaders, as, as you mentioned. And, um, and before when you were presented, you are the head of the CEO summit. At the end of the day, Yale give us this opportunity to access to industry leaders and to place us and to discuss with them uh, some of the things that, that are happening today in the business. Um, and I think those type of the venue that we have in Yale, the instructors that we have in Bay, the type of structure of the program, the topics, and, and even the classmates that we have are worldwide. And this uh, quality of uh, instruction is what I, at the end of the day, I was looking for when I did my due diligence, I compare, as Kino mentioned, different alternatives, but at the end of the day, you cannot match uh, what Yale is bringing to the table when you put all of these things together. Uh, well, thanks so much. Uh, and uh, I uh, then warned you the follow-up question is going to be, if with that uh, as the magnet that drew you here, uh, those respective qualities, did we deliver on it? Because uh, surely you delivered what we would have wanted is as uh, people on this call, as they take a look at the chat and who's there, you can see it's as far as we, you can tell, it seems like it, it's suggestive of the representativeness that we have with the three of you. But what we have, of course, if you just take a look at the headlines of the last few hours, we have uh, distress and confusion, some areas of excitement, but an awful lot of change in the area of social justice with diversity 
uh, in uh, equity and inclusion issues and a Supreme Court decision with enormous ripple effects. We've got somebody just in this little group of three of us could take us very far in that discussion. You know, we're going to spend the day talking about how do businesses, other institutions come to terms and understand what's unfolding there or taking a look at the complexities uh, from Russia, Ukraine, with um, ripple effects outwards of geopolitical disruptions when it comes to supply chain issues and the rest. Of course, Marcella, you could take us light years forward on that. And, and then if we were to take a look at the exploding world of the unknown in technology, what alarms us and what excites us, what, what's very clear and pragmatic, what's pretty abstract and unknown what is harmful and dangerous and what seems to be safer than people say is that we could spend the, uh, the day with you talking about our sentient systems in our near future and our computer is going to start to threaten us or uh, enable us. And is that, um, I, you know, I, I don't know, give, 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 give Chris an extra credit for the selection we have, but it's sort of what we would have in a program is that it's going to be frustrating to everybody on this call that we're not going to be able to tap your areas of expertise about what you do for a living because we're asking you to talk about Yale. But in our programs, that's what we hope that you guys talk about. So did we measure up uh, as a magnet to come here and what you were looking for, Madhu? Absolutely, uh, Professor. I think it was it was intellectually very stimulating, and for me, um, just the just the themes that you touched on, from geopolitical uh, disruption that's happening to uh, you know the supply chain issues that we were we were dealing with. You know, we uh, I remember uh, I remember discussing Chips Act for hours and hours in the class and what it what it meant our positioning with China and how it was threatening to tech industry so the the amount of diversity that that was brought to the brought to the uh, brought to our curriculum was extremely extremely rigorous and really kept kept the uh, cohort going and uh, and it it meant that we are taking those topics outside the classrooms and discussing them, not just over dinner, but also over the weekend. And it really created that bond, uh, not just within the class, but outside the class as well. And uh, Kido touched on faculty. It was um, it was amazing uh, faculty that that we got exposed with that that has been working with. Um, with PE firms in bringing their own their own uh, innovations to the market. So absolutely, yes, the diversity was phenomenal, and um, and the topics that we teased out definitely enriched my my uh, intellect and enriched how I position myself um, in my industry and um, and to the stakeholders that uh, that I I deal with day in and day out. Well, that's great. And I'm glad to hear that the faculty's relevant skill set, uh, cutting edge knowledge was uh, was helpful there. But I also like the fact and I don't want to undercut my fantastic uh, portfolio of colleagues, but that as you talk about your background uh, and every one of you, it's is that it was I think and if this is wrong. Let, throw it out there to the group for uh, for honesty and in, uh, in advertising here is that it was your rap backgrounds were always just as relevant, if not more so than the faculty. And I could tell you, as you heard in my bio, I spent 18 years at a well-known university just north of here. Uh, is that was not the case that things had to stay literally the case inside the structure of the case study, so that it was considered cheating to bring in the wealth of your knowledge. Sometimes the case study is a stimulant to get into a broader array. But if you have expertise in the areas that you have in AI and, 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 and nascent technologies and, uh, and and Kino can take a look at a Supreme Court decision and catapult us forward, uh, or, or you, Madhu, at, you know, and Marcelo can start to talk to us about continuity supply chains going through pandemics, technology changes, source issues, global wars, uh, or, or all the rest and all the parts of, is that that's all relevant. We wanna hear about it, uh, Kino? Did this place measure up to what you looked for in terms of the, the magnet of values that, that brought you here? I mean, honest, honest, for real answer is yes. And I'm not just like, for real, yes. And here's the why. All the reasons that everyone is named, plus the fact that um, for me, the curated curriculum of not only the instructors, but the cohort members and the, the absolute expertise of fellow cohort members just added so much value. 
And the thing that I remember the most of the courses, and Jeff, you were really, really uh, like excellent at uh, recognizing whenever there was healthy tension in the room and like curating a truly substantive conversation. We all respected each other because we had heard each other's stories. As Madhu said, we were hanging out. So there was always that, that baseline of respect, which allowed us to even go even further into like the deeper conversations, even when we disagreed, which was like the richest of the conversations to me. So all the things that you see in the brochure, plus just those things that don't actually make it in the brochure, but it's the actual experience that you have while you're there. Like that to me is the greatest takeaway, which continues. So the, the cohort experience and the, the, the courses is just the beginning. You know, we're still in touch. Uh, I think, Maju, you spoke at a uh, cohort members event, you know, not too long ago. I'll be speaking at that event. Like, we, we're still, like, supporting each other, and we're still engaging with each other, and, we're, and we're now we're inviting each other into our worlds, too. So it's, yes, absolutely. That's, you know, that's fantastic, and I, uh, I thank you for the compliment on discussion management, but it, the way adults learn, and this is a hard part for uh, a lot of management schools, a lot of business schools, when they get into executive education, uh, they think that we're just going to teach you the same old case studies that we would teach uh, young MBAs uh, and maybe teach them faster and maybe it's not graded, uh, but it's 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 reworking the same material. And many times the, the teachers will have their backs to their classroom and they're writing algorithms on the blackboard. They're not facilitating the peer exchange where so much of the learning takes place. So I'm, I'm so glad that you volunteered that on its own. How do adults learn? is adults learn a little bit differently than the rote uh, memorization or the um, the deductive learning of, of even very smart young people. It's a little bit more deductive. The inductive nature of finding patterns and and seeing creative cross you know lateral linkages and opportunities are what comes out of this kind of session. And also candidly, um, you're for the most part looking for something a little bit more uh, pragmatic, a little bit less theoretical. There's we have plenty of time for discourse and lunch and discussions and a lot of things around the general university campus that are highly abstract, theoretical, and mind stretching. But you also kind of know what can I use back on the job, and that is a responsibility we have that we know that this is a, a, a an expensive in many ways, not just in terms of financial cost, but disruption from friends and family and the other parts of your lives that you put a lot of trust that every minute is worth your time with us. And we wanna make sure you're learning from each other and not, not put back in the kind of learning that you could do, uh, you know, watching a, a C-SPAN show or something like that. But anyhow, Marcelo, okay, do you disagree with anything you've heard so far? No, not at all. Uh, I come with uh, very high expectations based on what I knew about the program. And, and obviously with my interaction with the program staff while doing, as I mentioned before, the, the due diligence. Um, we have to start by the core. At the end of the day, the, the program has very clear objective of what, what the program wants to do. And, and this is to produce global leaders. At the end of the day, this is the reason why we are here. And this is what I was looking for. So when you put together what the program core is, together with the methods that we are going to have in the learning, which is exactly what you just mentioned, for example, how we engage in the classes, plus, um, the idea that I want to bring back to my organization, financial management, uh, business knowledge, entrepreneurship, um, this is all tackled during the program. Now you go to the program and one of the things that you don't know is exactly who your cohort is going to be, who are the other executive or similar executives situated in situations like you are going to be in the program. And when you see that all the group that is put together by the administration of the product, you see that program goes beyond your expectation. So you end up with a program that is, because of the structure, going there for a week and then going back, which is the online offline that Kino was mentioned, makes it extremely dynamic. If you see that it's individualized, because at the end of the day, they are working focusing on you. It's interconnected because we are working together with all our cohorts in, and out, as Madhu was saying, it's a very well-rounded program. And it obviously, with the coaching, with the content, with the professors, it exceeds all the expectations that, that I had when I decided to go back. Oh, well, you know, I'm sorry. That, that's fantastic. And I'm glad we've, we've met those expectations. Is, uh, you know, here we are, we're about halfway through, our, or, you know, two minutes past the halfway through part, Mark. 
And you know, Kristen had sent me some great early questions that came in, but Kristen, I don't want to preempt if you see some questions that you've you've spotted coming in the chat that you think should take precedence over these four early questions. I also want to mention as a side as a front of the chat, I can't believe how quickly uh, Joanne is uh, is diving in to address a lot of the specifics on logistics issues around the the the, the program uh, and the. Uh, Look, look, you know, the, the the timing or application process or all the rest. And I don't know, Joanne, if there's anything you wanted to point out that you've already flagged in the chat or you want to wait till later. Yeah, we can hold. These are great questions and my fingers are flying. So keep them coming. Well, you are you are quick on the response. I I can't read as fast as you're typing somehow, but I'm trying to listen to our superstar panel. There's a lot of good information. It's sort of like watching those confusing Bloomberg screens where they've got so much data coming at you at once. What do you pay attention to? Everything here looks interesting. Kristen, did you want to uh, pull something from uh, some of the chat questions or or some of the pre uh, the prior questions that you think would be relevant now? Yes, I would love to. And I'd also like to recommend to those who are asking questions to send your questions to everyone. Right now, you're sending them to us as the hosts and panelists. Lovely. Um, but some of your questions are very similar to one another. And so as Joanne is typing responses, um, she can answer probably, let's just put it this way. If you have a question, it's very likely someone else on the call has the same has a similar one. So send it to the group and she can respond and, and answer um, probably more than one question at once. So, so uh, yes, we did have a couple of questions sent to us before the webinar, which was great. So we were able to just mull over some responses. One that came up again was um, if any of the participants, or I should say, if any of you on the call, Marcelo, Kino, Madhu, uh, had challenges like so uh, in the program. So what were your greatest challenges while you were in the program? I think that, that question has come up a few times. So let's start with you, Marcelo. Um, I would say that everything that had to do with the corporate uh, governance was one of the areas where I, I had the most challenge. I was, um, because of my background within the same company, within supply chain and being, if you want a family owned company, everything has to do with the role of the corporate governance, what makes a board. Um, it was very far away from my day to day. And, and as Kino, mentioned before i think the superb part of all the teachers that we have and especially jeff uh, who is a master let's say at the end of the day, in corporate governance is the one that helped us dive through this but but it's important to understand that um not many of us arrive to the program with the, this wide knowledge of what is a board and what is the corporate governance and when you really look to excel in an executive role leader in a C-suite. This is something that cannot be in your portfolio and cannot not be in your portfolio. So this was one of the biggest challenges for me to really understand and comprehend what it's all about. Oh, uh, terrific. Uh, as, uh, as Louis Pasteur says uh, to us uh, centuries ago, chance favors the mind that's prepared. And sometimes people, through uh, tragedies in the office or other kinds of disruptions that we've talked about through through the uh, program that had opportunities come their way earlier than they expected. And it's just nice to prepare for something that's beyond your immediate experience. And I did think that the board level governance issues were a stretch, but you guys were eager to dive into that. Uh, Madhu? Absolutely. And I think you touched on it. I um, I mean, um, being part of Big Four, um, I have been on board for nonprofit. And as I look at my career progression, um, one of the quests that I, I have is, what does the next chapter of my book look like? And that's really what, uh, what I came with. And, um, and it was phenomenal um, how the program really helped me shape right from uh, sharpening my sharpening my knowledge base on what does it really mean to be part of a non um, you know for profit board board of directors what does it really mean to be a ceo um, of of a for profit uh, company and what what does it really what does it really take uh, from running a pnl to go to market to having an understanding of supply chain and mixing it up with everything that's happening from geopolitical um, lever 
to the disruption that uh, technology is bringing in, I think it really helped me create a wrapper around me that made me feel that I, I have added many contours to the experience that I was looking at that will help me advance. The second challenge that I, I would want to talk about and just being very, very honest here was um, I, I have, a, we all had full-time jobs and we are all in leadership roles. So just getting away from your day-to-day -day life and, you know, diving deep into, into this phenomenal experience was you know i mean it was it was it was a mental challenge but uh, i mean again the support that we got uh, all of us and i'm speaking on behalf of my cohort um, it was it was really amazing we we were you know if there was time that i had to step away for for 30 minutes i did have the ability to a brainstorm with my team members and then also connect with my professor on what did I miss and have the ability to reach back to them in terms of, uh, you know, just shaping up my thinking and, and filling in what I might have missed. So um, I would say it was, it was a very, very fulfilling, uh, fulfilling experience in terms of even addressing the gaps that I came in with and, um, and addressing some of the, some of the challenges that I had from day to day management of my schedule that is very very interesting response too as you talk about the challenges of spanning boundaries one of them the first one of course across uh, across sectors and Kino could tell you from echoing uh echoing green and uh, purpose and things you know how the contrasts are as you span sectors but your second part the heck with organization life and sectors personal life is you have to span these different roles of being a student and and being an executive uh and others have challenges with being a partner a parent and other things in their lives is that we try to be flexible that way o offhand um i only can remember one incident in all the years of the program where we had one person who had the whose company was was circling the drain when he came into the program and actually went bankrupt during the program that we lost him for extensive periods only one person and we understood it, but it wasn't smart. And we wound up giving him some makeup time. Not that I want to encourage that to, to Chris and Joanne have to lose sleep over that. But it was, it was again, out of all these years and all the programs and all the people and all the complexities of, of uh, business life, uh, that was the one time. And I think somehow if somebody has to spend a little bit of time to be late from a class or uh, or um, uh, depart a little bit early uh, or something like that, is that we always find a way for some catch up that both classmates and the faculty are very much available. There are other faculties, I don't have to name the names of Columbia and, Har and places where you go down the hallway and the doors are closed all the time. You could see like tumbleweed blowing down the halls or unless, except when they're teaching themselves, they're not there. That's not the culture here. It, I would admit in the summertime here, uh, I'm perhaps the only person who's dressed up wearing a, a tie, but that's that's because my wife tells me it's slenderizing. But it's but mainly people are here in their offices all the time. So uh, if you uh, if you do need to see somebody for extra time for whatever reason, we're available. I'm glad you bring that up, Kino. Yeah, um, that really resonated with me as well. So crossing sectors, that of course there might be some topics that are discussed that didn't necessarily impact my work, uh, but were still interesting. Uh, but Jeff, going to what you said before that, I'm also reminded of people in our cohort who had life transitions in, in the sense of like losing their career or like switching to a different career or something like that and seeing the cohort rally and support them uh, was uh, another you know, unexpected benefit of just being part of this very, really close community. Um, and then module, like what you said, really resonated as far as being fully present. Like if those on the call take away anything from this call, if you apply and join, I can't stress this enough, excuse me for the noise outside, but I can't stress this enough of protecting the time as best you can. Uh, really try to be fully present. Uh, there was, you know, as, as all of us on the call, like we had uh, situations and responsibilities post-class and I've spent many times like after class just in the hotel room catching up on emails and making calls etc uh, but if I could do it over again I would probably not even probably I would definitely spend more time with my cohort members in the evenings uh, before be like 
take less um, time during the breaks, running out to make a call and just like being fully present for the courses and for the experience. Like that's that's one thing. Um, yeah, there you go. Plus one, you know, I mean, if if I was given uh, given an opportunity, I would replay. I would replay the experience and uh, and really spend spend more time with my cohort members and with uh, with the faculty. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Okay. Jeff, I don't know like something else you said. Uh, speaking to the faculty, like there wasn't the, the time that I did go out, it wasn't out of the ordinary to see like the faculty member who spoke to us that day joining us for dinner that night and just continuing the conversation. And that's that was just like a rare treat, also. We actually love it, and uh, they do just about pay us well enough. We can afford our own meals, and we actually come out not just because we're freeloaders, but in fact, we enjoy the company. But also, we we learn a lot from this from you folks. This is not a um a, a power driven relationship of a passive class and active professor but in ra rather we see ourselves as learning partners and there are just a lot of exchanges people get great ideas about the research they test things out in different sectors or industries uh but also just continuing the dialogue for the day many times we just go deeper than we can get in, in the bounds of a classroom people want to go further so uh both at, at dinners but also the breaks uh I think you find um, almost too many faculty coming by the breaks because they really want to snag you to talk more. And uh, so, you know, push us away if there are too many of us coming around to, to follow up and chatter. Kristen, uh, uh, another one you wanted to tee up at it for us? Thanks again, guys, for your remarkable candor. And you've also been piercing piercing the veil here as if as if we don't have this technology divide of a, of a Hollywood square setup and that we're all together in the same room. You guys are having a conversation as if we really are cheek and jowl, shoulder to shoulder. Kristen? Absolutely. We are getting some questions about um, the time be in between modules. So when you come to campus for your, the one week and two week long modules, you're in classes, all, you're in sessions all day. You wake up, you're here at 8.30, you're in sessions until 5 p.m. Yeah, and you are you get breaks up, you know, obviously, as, as Jeff was mentioning earlier, adults learn differently. And so you need breaks um, to be able to just give your brain time to re relax and absorb and appreciate all of the new insights you've just gained. So, but we're still you're put on a very intense path of learning. Um, you're taught you're meant and just as the panelists here were describing, like, you want to be invested and you want to be present for all of the sessions. Um, so it is pretty exhausting at the end of the day. Um, and coming out of COVID, what we began doing was instituting monthly virtual meetings between the cohorts. Um, and something I think that this is something that Kino and Mahu could speak to best. And something you two could describe what those monthly check-ins were like and how your time was spent between modules. Um, <clears throat> Any insights there? Kino, why don't we start with you? I, I can also bring it over to Madhu. Madhu, I saw you went off mic. Did you want to start us off with that one? I, I can, uh, Kino. I mean, I, I remember uh, the first, uh, the first um, Zoom session that we had, I dial in and Professor Sonfield is talking to IBM CEO. That was my first introduction to uh, to my uh, monthly touch points, and it doesn't it doesn't happen, uh, you know, very often that I'm on a call with a with a new a new CEO that's reshaping what uh, what uh, you know two hundred plus year old company would look like. So that's the kind of experience that you get on on site as well as uh, as off site and you know CEO summit in New York. But in between, um, you know, when we, when um, you know, Yale introduced this monthly touch points, the they tease out and bring in market leaders and and folks that are really reshaping our policies. They are reshaping the industries, so they keep you very connected with what's happening, what you're reading on, on a headline. It was very, I mean, you you use the word exhausting. I would replace that with stimulating. It was extremely, extremely stimulating uh, for me. And um, and again, I will speak on my cohort because this is the experience that we all had. If we had to, if we had an opportunity and privilege to do it again, 
we will absolutely come and do it again. It, it really filled in a lot of gaps that we, we brought in, right? Uh, it reshaped us as, as different professionals and reshaped us as different people because of the bonds, connections that, uh, that we build in. Kino just touched on me being, um, you know, I was invited as a keynote speaker in one of my cohort team members company where he's a CEO. I, I wouldn't have had that opportunity and it was such an enriching interaction. So overall, I feel that um, it was the monthly connections were really keeping us connected to what is happening from an outside in perspective. And then within, within the cohorts, it was giving us an opportunity to really build those deeper bonds and relationships. Oh, thank you very much. And thanks for mentioning the, the resource we draw on of hundreds and hundreds of CEOs that we bring in at different mixes uh, each month or in class that makes sense. And the CEO Summit itself that, that many and the YGALP attend is in person. It's the world's first school for incumbent CEOs. Something so shriekingly obvious, you think some other university would have done it, but they haven't. We're it. Before there was the World Economic Forum in Davos, before that, before, before, before Forbes, Fortune, Business Week, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, or Bill Gates of Microsoft or others pulled CEOs together. We started this. We've done uh, 136 program so far over the last 34 years. And uh, it's uh, we actually helped all these other competitors enter the space to do things that are more spouse oriented or public policy, but not really focused on the business. So, uh, and we aren't selling anybody anything. They're lively, interactive uh, forums. So we have a unique bond directly personally with the CEOs of many of the largest and most diverse and, and, and exciting businesses out there to come and join us. Uh, but uh, the, the monthly experience is one opportunity for that. I'm glad you mentioned that, Madhu, but there are other things that also happen in um, other schools, other programs don't have that. And, you know, we'd love to hear what you've done. This is, this is by the way, the vexing challenge historically uh, in the study of adult learning and executive education is they call it the technical term as the transfer of knowledge back to the job is a lot of things seem to make sense when you're sitting there in a classroom and then the program's over and then suddenly you get back and none of that language works some of those concepts seem too ethereal you don't have the support around you is that by going back for a while and then coming back to see us again uh you hold us accountable but the monthly calls is an opportunity to trade ideas with one another and say, hey, I tried that on it, Jeff, it didn't fit. And or, you know, Kino, is this a can you did you try it and have a different experience? So it's that transfer of knowledge is is very much facilitated by that kind of a follow-up, Kino. I mean, yeah, plus one to everything Maju said, the uh continuing of, of the conversations. I'd also like to talk about another gathering that happened in between that was just amongst cohort members where we were like doing some peer learning with each other, someone would bring a challenge and we could just wrestle with it together, like in a brain trust format, uh, as well as share feedback to you all as the Y Gelp staff. And I just always appreciated how responsive you were to that. And I could feel a different experience based on our feedback every time we gathered in the physical one. So like there was an ongoing uh, just back and forth exchange, which I appreciated as well. Uh, excellent. Uh, Marcella? Jeff, um, when I did the, the course, our check-ins were maybe not with a whole group. Uh, what I did prior to the pandemic. But if, if you ask me what what I used to do was to prepare the next week back in, in Yale. Uh, we have the agenda in front of us. We know who the speakers, who the professors are going to be. We know the books that are going to be shared with us. And, and if you want to pick uh, somebody's brain and, and you want to to start the conversation, there is nothing better than to read what that person wrote. Um, just for, for everybody that is in the call, um, I give you an example. I, I never thought I would be talking about neural connectivity and, and there was a book called Connected. The, the, maybe the, the title itself doesn't say, doesn't say much. And this is from, from Professor Nicholas Kristakis. And once you start reading what Kristaki wrote about network connections and how you can evolve and bring in these networks into the real world, into a factory, into a group of people working together and so on. Uh, you really understand that the more you prepare for those classes, the more you're going to interact with your professors. And that's what I did uh, between, between modules. 
I read as much as I could in order when I came back and in that week that I was there, I maximized everything that I can get from, from them. And at, at least that was my strategy back there, uh, Jeff. Tells you great use of time. Kristen, do we have time for one more? What do you think? We sure do. Uh, I think like there's a question that's come up a couple of times about who um, Jeff just submitted a really great question too. Not you, Jeff, Professor Sonnenfeld, but a different one. Um, we have so many great questions coming in. I want to ask the I want to ask the group about their highlights of the program. Um, a question came in about ROI. When was there was there a moment that that you hold in your mind as being like the the moment that says this investment of my time or and my money this moment in the program made it worth it madhu let's start with you thank you so much for that question and um and i will say um, i mean if you're talking about roi just the roller decks that you you end up building uh, i mean you finish you wrap up the program with a ceo summit and you get to you get to interact with the ceo think tank that you didn't have, you wouldn't really normally have exposure to. I remember meet, meeting CEO of Ethan Allen. He happens to be a very close friend of uh, Professor Sonafield. He's from he's from Kashmir, where I I'm from. So just that interaction itself was amazing. So there are many many ahas like that uh, throughout the throughout the program. So the ROI is absolutely there. I do want to call out on on uh, one experience that was very personal to me, and and uh, it was it it was definitely the highest point for me. We were in a session, and we knew that Indra Nui is uh, is coming for that session, and um, and I was super excited, as as uh, you know, all my cohort members members uh, could could tell, and Professor Sonfield also saw that. And as uh, as we started with the introduction, as uh, Professor Professor Sonfield started with the introduction, he let me open the open the session, and that was that was so precious. It was it was phenomenal experience and uh, very very emotional as you could as you could tell. Just the very fact that he paid so much such a keen uh, keen interest and he zoomed in. And really cared uh, for uh, for my um, you know for my admiration for Indra was it it was I mean it was very touching so I mean that's the care that's the that's the attention that you would experience in this program I mean I still till till I mean I will carry that experience I will carry that interaction that I had with Indra one on one. Um, you know, till till the end, because I do I do hold her at such a high stature. So, uh, but you know, I mean, if you talk to anybody, including Kino, uh, within our cohorts, they all have such ahas. Your own engagement at that moment uh, was definitely uh, uh, electrifying, uh, catalytic to us all, and you you certainly seized seized the moment, uh, Kino. Yeah, I mean, so many, that's a hard question to answer. Like many moments in class that were those light bulb moments, uh, those speakers that were announced, as well as those that we didn't know were there. Like sometimes we'll be doing a case study and we're really digging into it, broken up into teams, then we're presenting our, our points of view. And then Jeff points to the screen and the person that we're talking about is on the screen. And then they walk <laughs> us through like the actual decisions. Um, but I, I well, and there was another one where we got to interact with Yale students who were interested in entrepreneurship. So we just had a, a dinner evening with them and just offering advice to them, which was really special. But I think the one that crossed my mind the first at first when you asked that question was like our last day. And that's like when it really hit me, uh, where we were going through this process. It was officially coming to an end as we were being like invited or welcomed into the broader Yale community. Uh, and that's like when it really hit me that this this thing is just the beginning. Uh, so I guess my my final answer to that is like the next one. Uh, my favorite experience is like the next one because I know they're just beyond going. So well said, Keno. That's of course why we 
we call the close uh, commencement because commencing it is commencing. The, the, the graduation is not terminating. It's just beginning commencing. Uh, Marcelo. Just let me add um, to what the guy said here. Um, if you're analyzing the return um, other than what they said, you have a quantitative part and a qualitative part. The network that you build is it's tangible. So at the end of the day, there is a return there that you didn't have. You invested on something and, and that something is a group of friends, colleagues, peers, confident that, that you can ask and go and touch them. And, and this network of cohorts, professors, and so on is part of what you work and you build during this, this, pro, this project. And, and Kino just touched on the broader Yale community, which, which I was going to, to, to touch base on that. And I think that's the tangible thing on it. And then when you go back to, to your own work and there is some looking inside you and, and trying to, to see uh, how you can be better, how it teaches yourself to, how it teaches you to, to trust on your instincts and, and, and you can back arm with a lot of insights that are science back if you want, but they're insights that makes you a better decision making leader. That's another tangible result, at least for me. You gain, I gain a lot of confidence on my abilities to tackle the diverse challenges that again, because of my background, one company, many years doing supply chain, um, I didn't have. So the return for me was tremendous uh, coming to the call. Fantastic, so happy to hear that. And I, I know that, uh, that, that, that Kristen, Joanne, that with the precious time left, you wanna say a word or two in closing. I just wanna say, I've studied these programs that uh, they, the earliest ones began after the second world war. The very first one of an executive, senior executive program was actually at, uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, followed quickly by one at, at Harvard and then Columbia and Stanford, and MIT, others picked up on them. They, the original ones were literally called the retread program. They were created for military brass that was being retrofitted for civilian society after the second war. None of these programs existed until then. And they really were all just uh, faster ungraded MBA programs running about 14 weeks in length with the pace of business life changing. They got reduced to, to, to 12 to 10 and now some are six to eight weeks and things. Uh, but still, and, and, and being away for that contiguous period of time, you wondered, there were usually people who were about to get a, a giant job. Not anymore. If you can be off the job and missed for six or eight weeks, it often was an expensive outplacement program. You didn't go back to the job and see what's going on. And I remember times somebody would call on the phone during a break and the phone ring and ring. And they'd answer and say, Marcelo's office. And he'd say, oh, that's all I wanted to hear. Just want to know I still have a job back home. Is that this is designed to be uh, both uh, the learning style, the, the currency of the information, and the way we, the, the, the process of learning to be addressed to very accomplished uh, adults in the real world. But I should get out of your way, just other than to say the generosity of the three of you, there's nothing in it for you to do this for us today. Uh, we're not paying you for this. We're not getting commissions on who signs up. And it's just your, 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 your wonderful generosity and loyalty that we appreciate you doing this. Oh, absolutely. And all your... Oh my God, so much grace, so much humor, and so much love being shared on this call today. Thank you all so much for sharing your experiences with us. And thank you all on the call for sharing so many wonderful questions with us. Uh, we, as Joanne has mentioned in the chat, um, please send us more questions. We're here to answer them. And we I we could only begin to answer the, the mountain of questions that you sent us. And Joanne's fingertips certainly sent through many answers, but we weren't able to address all of them, answer all of them, um, despite our best efforts. Uh, so um, bear with us. Uh, we have uh, your questions and your comments saved. Um, so we'll, we can follow up on all, but also please reach out to us directly. Uh, Joanne dropped our email address in the chat. So grab it, save it, send, send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Privileged to be here with you all. Thank you again. And Thank wish wishing wishing luck to all the all the prospect students. Thank you all for joining the call. And uh, we were so grateful to share this time with you. Please let us know if you need anything else. And 
again, whatever path you choose. If we hope that it's with us, but if it is not, um, we understand and we hope that we could just be a helpful resource to you along your professional development journey. Uh, please let us know. <laughs> this was a wonderful time this afternoon. Thank you all. And that's it. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.